Crashed That's the one. Then. Very good. Okay, uh, it's 15 minutes in theory, so it shouldn't be too long. I like to do this every year just to give a quick overview of the last 12 months of the three um, continuous uh, testing things that I oversee. The OSS fuzz stuff, the crash testing, and then the Coverity scan. OSS fuzz first. Uh, this one is thanks to Google. Uh, Google lets us use their infrastructure and their resources and their framework that they use for fuzz and Chromium uh, to allow a number of open source projects to uh, fuzz their uh, projects. And we use that extensively. And we continuously fuzz our import filters. Uh, it's a little diagram of the process. The important bit is that um, the stuff is built on Google's side. We don't build and send it to Google. Uh, Google just pulls it down uh, daily and, and builds it with that script. Uh, we have 45 targets uh, in BCL Workbench, so that's 45 uh, individual file formats that we target. And then on their side, they build them with four different combinations. So there's 180 actual fuzzers, fuzzers running uh, continuously, 24 by 7, 365, etc. Uh, Configuration-wise, uh, it's difficult for us because we're designed to use dynamic libraries and the OSS fuzz is designed not to use dynamic libraries. But we do have an out that we have this disabled dynamic loading feature that was intended for iOS, and we can use that instead uh, to target the, the, the fuzzing uh, architecture. Uh, the individual fuzzers are, are quite large. They come around maybe 200 megs. They're each individual massive single binary, and that doesn't help us with our speed but they are functional. We also don't run with a configuration layer. Uh, we run with various hard code defaults suitable for, for fuzzing. And we avoid configuration. Uh, that link then is a link to where we keep uh, little C corpses for about 60 file formats, the 45 that I mentioned earlier, and then a bunch of others that belong to third party libraries that we also use for import stuff. So they're good useful information if anybody else wants to run their own fuzzing stuff. Okay, so OSS Fuzz reports this year. There's the last four years. You can see that the first two years that OSS Fuzz was operating, it was generating more than one bug report a day, one and a half, nearly two times, uh, uh, two bug reports a day. This is a huge amount of effort and huge amount of work. An awful lot of those were duplicates. Uh, the same for the following year. And then finally, we had a big drop in 2019 where we managed to get ahead of the fuzzers and we were getting days in a row without actually finding any problems at all. This year, there's been a slight uptick uh, because the uh, a new route into some old code that's full of bugs has been opened up that the uh, fuzzer can find. So once the fuzzer has found its way into it, uh, it goes to town and, and finds every error that has existed for the last uh, decade. So yes, it's it's good to get um, the fuzzers into as many areas as possible. So a huge significant amount of work there. So that's what uh, the OSS fuzz looks like. Uh, the, it shows you these various features, and then the part one is highlighted there that they minimize the test case automatically for you. So a large crasher is, is brought down into a quite a small little document. Uh, just an example of the kind of thing it finds. What often happens at this stage is that somebody makes a change, and the fuzzer the next day will start uh, generating reports that something terrible has been discovered. Before that, it was telling us stuff that was existed in our code base for decades. So this is the kind of thing that happens. Somebody makes a change, uses a smaller type than they should, and then you get this simplified sanitizer, and you get these kind of reports. Uh, a lot of work in the OSS fuzz is, is not actually um, uh, uh, the crashers, but timeouts. Uh, OSS fuzz will, will stop uh, logging timeouts when it gets when it finds one at a particular fuzzer. Uh, so there's various features and ways to get around that. You can limit the input size of the uh, document that's being fuzzed. Uh, you have a difficulty even there with some of these file formats have effectively practically infinite decompression support. Something like a TIFF can give you one line of an image and then basically can give you a number that says there is this many number of duplicate lines going to follow that line. So you can have a document to exhaust your memory by basically saying you have one line that have a huge number saying duplicate that previous line this number of times. So there's various ways around that. Uh, you have to um, derive something from the input uh, um, uh, limits to give you output limits as well. So yeah, there's a whole set of infrastructure around around doing that. We have, as well as timeouts, you've got memories. And again, the similar problem here as well. And then various features. We use the libjpg turbo because that gives us the ability to limit the amount of memory that's used by 
by JPEGs. Uh, the classic lib JPEG doesn't have that uh, capability. And then again, with, with spreadsheets, you can have infinite spreadsheets. Uh, so here we have um, uh, um, some arbitrary limits that are applied to that. Um, am I still uh, audible? Anybody there? Yes. Good, good. Just making sure. Uh, otherwise, you're a crazy guy talking to your own laptop. Uh, so this is the current situation as when I took this uh, screenshot. This is all the open bugs we have from the uh, OSS Fuzz. It's only got timeouts uh, left. After I took this slide, I fixed um, two or th fixed four of those timeouts. And like I said in the earlier slides, only one timeout is reported at a time. So two days later, it had found uh, two new timeouts uh, to replace the four that are gone. So the number of timeouts is, is fairly stable. It's always some documented timeouts in, in some way or other. Yeah, so that's the OSS fuzz, um, keeping the security uh, reports to a minimum if possible and finding things before they actually get shipped. That's the first of them. The second one of these continuous things is this crash testing. Uh, again, with the crash testing, um, we have 116,200 documents, mostly pulled from our own Bugzilla but also from Red Hat's Bugzilla and Mozilla's Bugzilla and some legacy documents from Novell's Bugzilla before it became private and other places like that. So these are not your ordinary documents. These tend to be documents that are reported as bugs because there's something unusual about them in the first place. So we import them all. And then for many cases, we re-export them all, all automatically. Uh, recently, apart from uh, uh, exporting them, we also then re-import what we've just exported and see does any of this crash. If any of this crash, um, we extract uh, back traces from the core dumps and we collect up all the information about what crashed and we send it to the email, uh, send the link to that data to the email uh, list, the developer email list. Uh, this year we have new hardware. Uh, last year we were taking us about three days to do a full run on that um, 116,000 documents. These days we're doing next day results, so I can set it off in the evening and the next day I can be sure that I'm going to get the results in again, which is a huge, huge, huge improvement. And that's like to thank Ed Finnis there for that. Uh, Christian and the boys apparently have, have helped us there. So this is the stats of what we have for the last 12 months on the crash testing. So the number of bills at the moment, so we had 73 or whatever it is, 76 bills this year. And uh, I can see there's a huge number of clusters at the start and then things pan down again. So we have a kind of a persistent collection of about 10 documents that are causing difficulties for import. Uh, there's a difficulties with footnotes, with tables and footnotes, probably tables and footnotes in Writer. Uh, it's one of those problematic areas. The other issues over the year have been uh, parallel importing issues in Calc. But I believe they're all fixed now as well. The crash testing allows us to um, find those things. Often people will deliberately put in asserts in the code uh, that weren't there before in order to get the crash testing to trigger so they can find real world examples of uh, corner cases that they want to investigate. So yeah, it's a, it's a useful resource for not just for um, finding regressions, but also for actively searching for documents that can prove or disprove something you're trying to investigate. Exporting. Exporting is, we have had no export failures for, for a number of, of weeks now, so that's quite good. They tend to jump in huge lumps like that, as you can see. We tend to have very few export failures, and then when we do have an export failure, we tend to hit it um, yeah, a, a huge number of times. Yeah. Right, so that's the second one. That was crash testing. The last one then is just Coverity. I We've had should see that car. Been using Coverity for quite a while. Uh, un unlike the OSS Fuzz and with Coverity, you, you build it locally yourself with their tooling, and you upload that blob to their um, server which does whatever magic analysis it does in that blob of information. Uh, the link to the project there, it's a public project for the last year or two, before that it was private, so it's now public and you don't need to request uh, from me any specific permissions to, to view uh, the bugs or any historic bugs, they're, they're all just publicly available. Uh, the scans uh, uh, used to be just one language editor, you designated your project to be a C++ or a Java project, but it has grown the ability to to manage both of them now, so we get both sets of warnings in the one instance. Uh, we do have to drop down the version of C++ we support. The maximum that Coverity supports is C++ 17, so we have to uh, go back down to that version. And we only uh, scan our own source, we don't scan any of the source that we include from third parties, so 
not not uh, open SSL or NSS or Python or anything like that, just just a road source. Uh, this is what it looks like. You get an initialized member warning like that. And uh, this is a common enough one is where people uh, add a member to a class, they remember to uh, in, initialize it in one of the constructors, but they don't realize that there's two or three constructors and they haven't initialized in the other ones. So that's a useful warning you kind of get. Uh, sometimes you get warnings that aren't so useful. So a lot of the work with Clarity is to identify that these things are deliberate. So in case you have something where you're deliberately not initializing something, this is the kind of markup you can use. And so there's two types of markup. In the first one there, you just uh, Coverity and you use the name of the uh, warning and the previous one you'll see the warning is highlighted here when in each member you use that same name inside in the uh, square brackets and uh, you put a comment afterwards and that'll be automatically uh, marked in the user interface as intentional and the other one then is where you use the same uh, text but a full colon and false and it'll be marked as a false positive. Uh, that's handy for me because um, if you just mark it as such in the user interface directly and then when we in Red Hat run this stuff through our own separate Coverity instance, it won't be backed as uh, those deliberate or false positives. So it saves me effort if it's done this way in the first place. And also helpful if the code is moved around the place, Coverity tends to lose track that it's uh, the original code that I saw the last time and doesn't realize that it's the same issue. And the issue's a new one. Now you can use this markup to say that something is intended to exit the program. Uh, so you can mark various paths as being fatal paths and then Coverity won't argue about um, uh, and it will base its future decisions on the logic of that so it can be convenient to uh, mark that for the C++ uh, CPP unit stuff which is marked like that so when that fails it just exits the program as far as Coverity is concerned. Uh, tainted data uh, it's probably not that relevant anymore but there are ways to um, uh, tell Coverity that the data is trusted if you know it is trusted so it's an internal data format and it won't complain that you have to uh, be more careful about that, uh, that data. Here's an example of something where you should check it, where you need to check if something like that in resource length, that resource length is, is valid data or not. It may be outside the length of your file, so it's probably not a good idea to allocate a ginormous block of memory based on a claim of a uh, random file format. Yeah, so uh, I think this is, might be our last, second last slide. Uh, so this is just the historic data of how many bugs we had initially um, uh, uh, and how many we have now. So we started off somewhere not too far off 10,000 and we're now down to uh, effectively zero. And you can see the little gap there when um, we, we didn't even get C++ 17 support in Coverity. So we're out of action for a few months. This is this tier stats. Uh, I waited deliberately until I got to uh, a state just there a few days ago of, of zero bugs again. So yes, so this year, like last year, I'm able to present the final slide that we are Coverity zero bug free as far as they're concerned. And uh, I presume as you've seen from the product, we obviously have no bugs. So um, Coverity is telling us the full truth here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to let everyone know, um, we rescheduled Sarah's talk. Her talk will take place shortly after the um, the two lightning talks that we have uh, that are coming up. And so, um, uh, uh,